and welcome to another instalment of the BRR Media Self-Managed Super Fund Industry Roundtable Series. I'm your host, Michael Killicoat, and today we'll be discussing tailoring your investments in an SMSF for life stages. And joining me as usual today are a couple of industry experts to help me discuss. Uh, firstly, my regular guest, Ben Anderson from Future Estate. Welcome back, Ben. Thanks for having me, Michael. And joining me for the first time is David Linko from Vow Wealth. Welcome, David. Good morning, Michael. So if we just start, David, uh, can you just tell me a little bit about Vow Wealth? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Firstly, Michael, um, Vow Wealth is the leading mortgage aggregation business in Australia. Um, Vow Wealth uh, has expanded over the last couple of years to provide a full financial services offering. So uh, starting off with mortgage broking as their core, services to mortgage brokers that now provide a full financial planning service. Uh, legal and conveyancing, uh, commercial finance, uh, motor vehicle leasing uh, to provide, uh, I suppose, a diversification model for brokers. Okay, so if we just jump into it now, uh, so what do we mean by life stages in a SMSF? Yeah, life stages are particularly important um, because it's, it's critical to make sure that the investment strategy matches the time frame uh, for investment for investors. and. So often they can get it wrong if they don't understand their life stage and the time frame that they've got to consider their exit strategy. So why is it important for, for people to consider? It's, it's very easy for, to get this wrong and the consequences are quite significant in terms of dollars lost or the investment strategy not being at a stage where um, it's ready to be harvested. Uh, for example, let's say, let's say you're approaching retirement and you set an investment strategy, regardless of asset class at this stage in time, Let's say you select an investment class or an asset class that takes maybe 10, 15, 20 years for maturity and you're approaching retirement and you enter the asset class, uh, it could be that you have delayed retirement um, and you have to keep working. So it's very important to understand your life stage and the time frame associated with that before the exit strategy can be uh, considered. Hmm. So I guess with uh, investment horizons, time frames also, sort of risk profiles change over that period as well? Absolutely, Michael. Um, let's consider, say, someone who's uh, newly married. Uh, they'll have a high disposable income. So whether it's within the SMSF environment or outside the SMSF environment, I think we need to be aware of the cash flow, the, um, the next life stage that the couple or, or individual are going to be entering, whether it's retirement or having children or empty nesters. And then looking at an asset class and the cash flow associated with that to then set it so it's sustainable and it's really set and forget. So uh, what, what are the, some, some of the things people should uh, consider when uh, putting a portfolio together? Well, I think it's pretty simple really. It doesn't have to be complex because one of the, one of the um, confusing elements when people look at this aspect of discussion is try to focus on asset class but also forget about the asset class and let's talk about cash flow. Because any wealth creation strategy is firstly about uh, making sure you've got enough cash flow to keep the investment class going. Whether it's negatively geared or positively geared, let's look at the cash flow. So figure out your budget, pretty simple. Um, and most people don't like looking at budgets because they don't want to figure out how much they spend on fuel or entertainment or going to the movies. I say look at your last six months credit card statements or even 12 months, add up everything that's there to do with personal, and that's the annual expenses. And then if you do have time, go into all the details. But initially, uh, I'd rather you have something than nothing. So just uh, summarise your last six months credit card statements or savings account statements, that's your total annual cost for living. And then figure out how much your income is and the difference is how much you've got to deploy for an investment strategy. So that's number one and that's critical because then you'll make sure that the investment is appropriately aligned to your surplus cash flow. Hmm. And Ben, what are the, some of the things at Future Estate you look at for, uh, for, for life stages? Yeah, look, we've actually got a, a, a lot of e-books on, on the website if people would like to have a look for the different generations within super. And obviously, when people are in that asset accumulation phase, um, property investment can be a great way to build, build wealth within somebody's portfolio, whether that be within self-managed super or, or outside of it. I guess the considerations, as David's mentioned, it's very important to consider, using the example of a, a newly wedded a couple, you might have a situation where at the time that a property loan might be taken on, there's two people working and two people contributing to the serviceability of that loan. It's important to consider what implications you might have if, for example, there's going to be one person at home with a young family you know, around the corner and you're looking at this as a 10-year investment. So there's definitely looking beyond sort of what your existing situation is and considering what it might be in five years' time if you're looking at a long-term investment is of critical importance. Um, and obviously as you're coming into that retirement stage, it's very important to think about, particularly in the, in the sort of context of property, we've got a long-term asset class with 
borrowings attached to it to consider how you're going to reduce that mortgage down to where it is at least positive cash flow and serviceable in the context of people not working and contributing to that serviceability from, uh, from their, their, their earnings or from their contributions towards super. So we have a number of strategies to help people build up a portfolio, but then pay down that loan to where it's ungeared or very highly positively geared coming into the retirement phase. It's a good source of um, income for them in that retirement. Okay, if we just take a step back, uh, what are some things that don't change throughout the, uh, the different stages? Um, <laughs> Once again, it depends on your asset class, but it, it, there's a couple of different strategies for investor. One is set and forget, and one is more active trading um, in terms of the buy and sell strategy. So I think it's important to make sure your, your strategy fundamentals are set correctly, and then to allow for the income changes to take place. As you were saying, um, Ben, uh, if, if you're a newly married couple, you've got a 10-year strategy, you've got to be aware of the changing cash flows, and, and be aware that if you do have children, um, you've got to come up with another plan, because the cash flow won't be there. Mm. So anticipating that, um, if you wish to take a risk and, and go into that second or third investment property, knowing that if you have children, what are you going to do? Um, so I think change is something that will always occur. I don't think we can take the position that there will be no change. It's not to say you don't do the investment strategy, but you have a plan B or a plan C. So you're aware of all the contingencies. So if something goes wrong, it's not a case of panicking and making a decision when you're confused and under pressure, because that's the worst type of decision you can make but being aware that, okay, this scenario has happened, we allowed for this when we initially took out the investment, let's go to plan B. Well, plan B doesn't work, well, let's go to plan C. So everything has been thought through fully, uh, whether, it's, whether it's retirement, whether it's having the children, whether it's empty nesters, um, and that's why it's important to maybe look at a three, five, maybe even seven year time frame. I don't know what sort of time frame you, you look at, um, uh, ben, when you were looking at uh, your asset accumulation? Yeah, from a, for generally we look at it as a 10-year investment okay. horizon. I mean, I think the sort of rule of thumb, obviously, is with property investment generally look beyond five years. If you're thinking there's uncertainty of you holding that asset for less than five years, probably not the right time to be looking at that purchase. Um, so we generally look at accumulation over a 10-year period, and then uh, if people are sort of in an earlier stage of their life. So, for example, in the context of self-managed super, it's interesting that the statistics come out and... Uh, uh, Gen X are now the largest number by number in self-managed super and also by, by funds under, under management. So there's actually the largest pool of funds is actually Gen X, which is 1965 to, to 1981. So they're still in that asset accumulation phase. And a lot of what we're working to do is help people build up a portfolio within their super fund because it is a good place to be holding right. property with the tax incentives that exist. And then once that accumulation has occurred to pay down towards and in the transition to retirement so that it can be held ungeared or restructured that portfolio so there's a very low level of debt relative to the asset value, but it's, it's in excess of 10 years. I think you make a very good point. Um, as you get to the end of your, I suppose, portfolio life cycle where you pay it down, uh, to allow enough time for the maturity to take place. For example, in Sydney in the last five years, the growth hasn't really been that significant. Similarly in Brisbane, uh, Melbourne's gone through the cycles, Perth has uh, done similarly as well. So we used to, um, there used to be a lot of discussion about laying seven years or a doubling cycle of seven years. Mm -hmm. I would say absolutely 10, mm -hmm. maybe even 14 to mm -hmm. be on, on the conservative side. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we need to be realistic in terms of those property cycles to allow enough time so you can actually get that growth. Yeah, I think an interesting conversation we were having before we got on the show was about people sort of understanding how much they think they might need in retirement and planning ahead uh, to ensure that they've got an adequate pool of funds. And I think part of that obviously is, okay, how are we going to accumulate to that number? And that's across all asset classes, obviously, but also having a realistic expectation in terms of what a long-term sustainable return might be. And I think there is a little bit of a rebalancing of those expectations across the board. Mm -hmm. So not just in terms of property, but perhaps in terms of, I mean, obviously interest rates are lower and perhaps the returns you're getting from the stock market are lower than historically has been the case. And there may be a bit of a realignment of expectations of that sustainable return number. So in terms of calculating, well, I need a nest egg of X to last a certain period of time. Obviously, the important calculation is what is the return that you're going to generate off that nest egg each year. And if that's lower, the nest egg needs to be higher. So there needs to be a lot of planning going on, both yep, in terms yep. of your budgeting, but in terms of that accumulation as well. Yeah, and the complexity is there because most people we see for retirement have the superannuation nest egg, but they've also got one or two properties outside super. And often when you get retirement planning advice, the planner will just focus on the superannuation, but you've got two or three properties outside. So how do you merge them into a suitable retirement strategy? Mm. So I think a lot more discussion needs to be had in, in that area, particularly when the 
portfolio outside of super is negatively geared as you approach retirement. Mm, yeah. So it's, it's not straightforward, it is a bit complex, but you need to look at the whole discussion, uh, the, the whole portfolio to, to determine what is sustainable in terms of drawing out an income stream that will last you. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Uh, I recall hearing advice that uh, when you're younger you should be in more equities and, and a bit of cash, maybe some bonds and as you approach retirement. Uh, shift away from equities into, into more bonds and a, a steady income. Um, do you think with the, uh, the GFC in the last sort of five, five years uh, in the market that some strategies have changed, people have taken a hit and they're more risk averse or they're, they're chasing their losses um, from the, their, um, uh, the market share yep. of their, their portfolio? How do you think that's uh, affected well, things? Uh, I think that's a general principle that you've said, Michael, as, as you're younger, uh, you've got more time for retirement and you can ride out the, um, the fluctuations in the market. Mm -hmm. But a good rule of thumb to determine whether that's suitable for you is, let's say you had 100000 in the market and it takes a dip down to, say, $40,000. So you've taken a bit of a hit. Let's say, let's say you're a young person, so early 20s. Would you take the rest of that cash out of the market and put it into a term deposit? Would you, would you take some of it out? Would you leave it and write it out? Your answer to that is quite personal. That will determine your risk profile. Some mm. people I see would actually take the, the rest of their money out of the market and put it into cash. So they clearly shouldn't be in equities because they're not designed to, to take the volatility, even though they could write it out. So I think the general guiding rules of risk profiling, what you're talking about, are a good starting point. But you also need to pass the sleep at night test because you need to be comfortable that your, your money is growing um, at, a risk, at a rate that you're comfortable with. And, and each person is, is different, uh, and, and how do they determine you know, their, their profiles? Oh, well, then, it, it's a case of looking at how much uh, cash they've got available, how much surplus, um, as, as I said earlier, and they're designing a portfolio based around that, um, and how much they're prepared to lose, and how much time they've got to recover those losses. For example, if you're 22 and you take a bit of a hit, it's, no, it's, it's not that there's no big deal, but essentially you can write it out. So you've got to determine whether you're prepared to take the hit and recover it over the next 30, 40 years. Whereas that's very different if you're, say, 55, where a preservation of capital objective uh, takes over. You can't take the hit because you don't have the time um, unless you're going to live and keep working until 110 or 100. <laughs> so those general pr principles are only a guiding factor, but then you've got to look at the cash flow, um, investment mix and time frame. I mean, we've got clients who are very happy to keep working in their 79 and 80. And they're very healthy, and that's what they want to do. So in that sense, they're able to take a little bit more risk than otherwise would be applicable to someone of that age who's retired. And uh, do you have any examples of, of where this has gone wrong and then people haven't followed this advice and got themselves into trouble? Absolutely, and, and um, then we were talking about this earlier. Unfortunately, there's a lot of cases where this goes wrong. A classic example, I only saw someone yesterday. A young couple living in Epping, two kids, uh, five and two. Um, <laughs> husband works, he's a professional, they've got a home and they've got some surplus cash flow. He's moving to a self-employed area. Uh, so cash flow is starting to build up quite a bit. They're wanting to upgrade to a larger home in the next couple of years. But they're seeing the redraw in their home loan build up. At the moment they've got about 75, 80k. So they said, initially they said they would want to buy a larger home, uh, but they couldn't based on the income because he's self-employed. So then he decided to change the strategy by an investment property. And I thought, well, hang on, there's quite different goals here. So I went and had a chat to them. And they didn't realise the implication of buying an investment property on their goal of upgrading. So buying an investment property, they'll use the equity, um, which could prevent them to upgrade to buy a larger home. So in that case, clearly, the, the home was, was their paramount goal. But if they bought an IP, they weren't aware of the implications of that on the home. Um, another one, which is a classic one for retirement, is as people get to retirement age um, and they realise after doing the numbers that they don't have enough for retirement, they look to fast track it but they don't look at the risks and a clear case of that is buying properties late in retirement where you don't have the 10 years to, for maturity. If that's the case, they either keep working um, or they retire on a lot less. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's quite a common scenario, unfortunately. I know you, we were talking about that before. That's right. And I think also people approaching <coughs> retirement where there is that income orientation, so capital preservation, income orientation, I think. Um, some recent examples, obviously, in the GFC, we saw the mortgage fund sector. It was very appealing previously to retirees or people approaching retirement mm. from the perception of it being low risk, you know, liquid, and providing a good cash flow. Um, what we saw was actually that liquidity wasn't actually there when they needed it. Um, so a lot of people wanted to get out when that, some of the issues hit. 
they weren't able to access their funds and it hasn't been providing the distribution that was originally intended. And that's a, a good example of where something did go wrong. So it's important to get good advice and fully understand what it is that you are investing into and understand, okay, am I going to need this money? What's the investment mm. term? Does that meet my personal circumstances? And I think, you know, the mortgage fund industry is a, is a classic example of that. I mean, there's one fund at the moment which was one of the largest in the sector previously and we've got 10,500 retail investors that typically invest between ten dollars and $50,000 into the fund and they've been held into, you know, an Ill illiquid fund that's not generating cash flow for about four years, you know, and that's obviously if that was an important component of your retirement income would be a bad outcome. So it's about sort of making sure that the investment allocation is appropriate and there is enough liquidity and there's enough cash flow and it's been well thought through in terms of how it's constructed. I think that's an example of a, where it's gone wrong. If I can pick up a point from Ben regarding liquidity, uh, back in the heydays of the market uh, in the early 2000s where markets, well, property markets were just booming with extraordinary growth, a lot of people were gearing uh, and they were gearing and utilising all of their equity and and um, missing the fundamental fact uh, of affordability, looking at the negative gearing total cost, the pre-tax shortfall associated with holding three, four, five, maybe even six investment properties. And they were making the assumption that properties were going to double in value very quickly. And they were looking to um, harvest the lines of credit from the growth and fund it from the lines of credit. So clearly, um, they couldn't afford these uh, portfolios uh, in large negative yield amounts, and they were mm. assuming that they would grow and harvest the lines of credit to keep funding it. But when the market didn't grow, they actually had some very horrible uh, surprises there. And as a result, um, often they lost their homes as well, along mm. with the whole portfolio. And I think that, that it's a very important point to make, I think, and it does tie back into what we're talking about expectations of potential returns going forward. I think there has been a realignment in the context of, I mean, using the context of property, they uh, generally, I think it's fair to say that expectations of capital growth are a bit more subdued than <coughs> previously during the heydays. Um, <coughs> and now I think it comes back to now more focus on income orientation, making sure that the investments that you invest into have a sound cash flow coming from that asset. <coughs> we feel that there's an ability to service that loan and ideally where it's positive cash flow. Yep, yep. Yeah, I think we just need to be realistic. I, I think we're still caught up, a lot of people, in their decision making on the heydays, but a normal rate of growth um, is certainly not 8, 9, 10% that we used to have in Sydney mm -hmm. uh, and in some of the other capital cities. Mm. So let's get back to common sense, let's get back to fundamental cash flow and use that as, a, as a, just a, a framework for making good investment decisions. Okay, and just uh, getting close to wrapping up, how do people know if their investment strategy is affordable and matches their cash flows? Oh, we've got to understand as people move through the life stages, their circumstances are going to change. So this is why it's very important to do a review. Uh, that's the reason uh, you'll have a review with your financial planner or your accountant. Um, mm. so it's important to go to them and have a chat um, and just let them know what you're working through, what your next life stage is, looking to have children, kids are moving out, et cetera, et cetera, we're changing jobs. And that way, uh, you've got a sounding board to talk through what's happening with your cash flow, what your thoughts are, what your requirements are, whether it's a holiday, a new home, et cetera, et cetera. And for someone to critique that strategy, we call it a portfolio review, but it's a case uh, where your, your business partner or the person on your team, your investment team, is looking at that and critiquing it for you to make sure you haven't cons you've considered everything and that there's no stone left unturned. Okay, uh, we're going to have to leave it there because uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, but thanks once again. Uh, to my guests for joining me today, Ben Anderson from Future Estate. Thank you for having me, Michael. And David Linko from Val Wealth. Thank you, Michael. Okay, that's been another instalment of the BWR Media SMSF Roundtable Series. Another interesting and educational chat today. I look forward to uh, seeing you again in a couple of weeks for our next roundtable. I'm your host, Michael Killicote. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.